All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, give me just a moment to get this shared to my other timeline. I want to say welcome and thank you for joining me today. Uh, we appreciate and love all of you so, so very much. Thank you so much for watching. So um, anyway, uh, today I want to just say welcome to, uh, as he, uh, um, the book of Joshua, Type and Shadow. Yes, I have a lot of shows. Um, the, the book of Joshua, a type and shadow, and um, uh, this is an important broadcast because we really need to see some things from the scriptures. And so, uh, having said that, uh, I want to say uh, that uh, on this show, um, <clears throat> we are looking at uh, uh, Old Testament scriptures, and we're looking at types and shadows. Of, uh, of of things that um, are are presented in the book of Joshua, uh, such as the kingdom of God, uh, the eternal Christ, and the finished work. So as we look at these lessons, uh, it's very important to understand that uh, when we think that there's not any revelation uh, to be had, uh, uh, no revelation of eternal truth in the Old Testament, the fact is that's not the case, okay? Uh, it's just not true. And uh, we need to understand that eternal truth was established by our Father in eternity past. And He is the one who declared the end result of who you were to be, who created to be from the very beginning. Uh, so as we continue in this verse-by-verse -verse study, it's important to look at all Scripture through the proper interpretive lens, which is Father's eternal and unconditional love for His creation. So it's my goal as a teacher uh, to try and see what Father uh, was trying to reveal within a people of long ago, even as He was interacting with their version of their of the journey of their human experience. So let's get started as we dig deep into the well of Father's mind and see more types, shadows, and symbolic messages from the book of, book of Joshua. I want to say real quick, good to see Dr. Fay uh, joining us this morning and uh, others as you're already watching. All right, so uh, anyway, as we get going here today, we're going to look today, at, this is episode number uh, 46, episode number 46, and we're looking at Joshua chapter 9, verses 16 through 21. So I'm reading this today to start with, as always, from the New King James Version. And it says, And it happened at the end of three days, after they had made them a covenant, uh, made a covenant with them, referring to the Gibeonites, uh, that they heard that they were their neighbors who dwelt near them. 
Isn't that amazing? Now, we've been reading in chapter 9 how the, the Gibeonites, uh, all of these tribes that were just kind of uh, formed under one heading, the Gibeonites, uh, were were uh, said to have been from a far journey. We'll talk about that today. Uh, but uh, in reality, uh, they were uh, pe a people who dwelt near them. Uh, and, and he goes on to say, Then the children of Israel journeyed and came to the, their cities, and there on the third day. Now the city uh, where Gib Gibeon, or this would be pronounced uh, 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 Gib Gibeon, um, uh, meaning a uh, hill city. And uh, next to what you see there, if you're looking at these scriptures, uh, Kef, Kef Ira, uh, meaning lioness. Uh, and then that was also near uh, Be. A Roth, uh, meaning uh, wells, and then that also included a two-syllable uh, city uh, by the name of Ker Rath, uh, meaning city or town. But the children of Israel did not attack, or they did not strike them, because the rulers of the congregation had sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel, and all the congregation complained against the rulers. Then all the rulers said to the congregation, to all the congregation, we have sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel. Now, therefore, we may not touch them. This they will, uh, this we will do to them. We will let them live, lest the wrath, lest wrath be upon us, because of the oath which we swore to them. And the rulers said to them, Let them live, uh, but let them be woodcutters and water carriers for all the congregation, as the rulers had promised them. Okay, so interesting portion of Scripture, even though we've been tracking all along here and seeing several things. Notice here that this uh, is an interesting portion of Scripture in that the process of deciding what to do about uh, the deception of the Gibeonites uh, that we have been looking at in this chapter. So Joshua 9 verse 16 said, and this is the Amplified Bible, it happened at that three days after they had made a covenant or a treaty with them, the Israelites heard that they were actually their neighbors and that they were living among them. Wow. So if you remember right, uh, back in Joshua chapter 9 verse 6, it said they went to Joshua to the camp at Gilgal or Gilgal and said to him and to the men of Israel, we have come from a far country. Now, therefore, make a covenant or a treaty with us. And now, after much negotiation, as uh, an agreement was made. Okay, so Joshua 9.16 in the New English Translation says, Three days after they made the treaty with them, uh, the Israelites found out that they were from the local area and lived nearby. Now, from the translator's note here in the New, uh, in the New English Translation, uh, it says the Hebrew would read, At the end of three days, after they had made the treaty with them, they heard that they were neighbors to them and in their midst. Uh, were uh, they were living. Now, it's really important to understand that the point is that uh, some form of a treaty was made, but not that which the Gibeonites originally intended, not which they originally desired. So I think that's an important point. And remember what was said, the treaty was that uh, they would let them live, and which I also think uh, is is very interesting, okay? And so notice this, that, that uh, as this process is underway, it seems that the Israelites decide to visit this supposed far country, which was truthfully a short distance away. So in verse 17, the Net Bible says, so the Israelites set out uh, and on the third day uh, arrived at their city. So whatever the distance was we had been talking about in previous lessons, uh, that the Israelites traveled there in three days. So they came to the cities of, of, of Gibeon, of uh, Kephara, uh, and um, uh, uh, Beyaroth, and Keradath, uh, uh, or Keradath. Now, from uh, enduring word 
dot com uh, a com commentary here says all the congregation complained against the rulers even though they had complained against them the rulers still knew they had to do uh, what was right and honorable before God keep their oath even if it was a bad oath you ever made a decision and and you you kept the decision you kept the oath because you gave your word about something but in reality you knew that was a bad decision but it was one of those things that you just couldn't get out of so you kept your promise even though it was a bad promise or a bad thing now the rulers of Israel he goes on here to say were wise in not allowing one sin uh, wiping out the Gibeonites that was the sin they were talking about uh, to follow another sin making an oath without seeking the Lord especially in light of public pressure to do otherwise now comment a commentator named known as Hubbard writes the treaty is only three days old and Israel learns uh, that their new foreign partners are in fact Gibeonites a people on the uh, harem uh, hit list now, harem here is not spelled like a harem uh, in uh, Arabia, but this is a, a, a group or a particular idea. Now, notice this, that according to uh, Fisher Publication dot, uh, fisherpub.sjfc.edu, says, during the time of Joshua, the harem, H-E-R-E-M, was a necessary evil. The Israelites were entirely dependent on God just for survival, and it, it was just, uh, it was important that any, tr uh, any uh, treaty uh, to their uh, tr uh, to treat to their loyalty was eliminated to ensure that the Lord would continue to protect them. This is not to say that the harem is a necessary evil today. Now, the word harem, H E R E M, uh, is from the Hebrew is translated uh, uh, variously uh, as uh, proscribed or uh, devoted to destruction, or later as excommunication. Now, sometimes constructed as a verb, sometimes as a noun, harem refers to the separation or banning of something or someone. Now, keep in mind that people practice separation because they believed they were from Adam, and the concept uh, was all through their thinking. Now, I looked at a website called myjewishlearning.com, and they write, the Hebrew word harem is translated variously as prescribed uh, or devoted to uh, destruction. I think I just repeated that. Uh, but uh, the, the fact is that it's really important to understand uh, what this really means like. Now, uh, from Percept, uh, PreceptAustin.org, uh, they say this sounds like the son, uh, sons of Israel had thoughts of taking vengeance on the Gibeonites and the cities they were con uh, confederated with. Uh, presumably, all four cities were under the protection of the peace treaty the Gibeonites had cut with Israel. All right, so again, uh, four, four groups, four cities, but they come together as Gibeonites, and that was where the treaty was made. So uh, I want to talk about that. Now notice this. Um, there is never a mention of a king over Gibeon, or the Confederacy, that's what the commentators call it. Uh, this was part of the inheritance given to the tribe of Benjamin. Now, now as we move on from, uh, uh, good to see uh, Pastor uh, Humphrey uh, Malapini uh, joining from Zambia watching today, uh, one of our ordained uh, ministers. Uh, now, uh, Joshua 9 verse 18 in the New English translation says the Israelites did not attack them because the leaders of the community had sworn an oath to the uh, to them in the name of and the Hebrew says or the name by the name of the Lord uh, God of Israel the whole community criticized or they grumbled against the leaders now some say this is a mark of good of godliness which is to hold to an oath even when it is difficult uh, here again, uh, 
if you make a financial decision, this seems to be the most common of decision making that goes on. If you have make a, a financial decision, but after you've made that financial decision, uh, or even a move with your ministry, or you've made a commitment to another group of people or to a, a, a leader, uh, the fact is, is that when you make a financial decision and you back out on it because you realized after the fact that it was a bad decision, well, there are times when you have signed a contract and you cannot get out of that decision. You know it's a bad decision. you got to pay it out. you got to uh, pay the payments every month. But the fact is, is that you keep your word because it's a matter of godliness or godlikeness. So there is a footnote pointing to Psalm 15 verse 4 where David is asking a series of questions about the character of those who dwell with the Lord as his tabernacle. And he says this from the New King James, In whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. So the Israelites had made a mistake, okay? They made mistakes concerning the Gibeonites. And therefore, as they journeyed to their land, uh, they did not attack them because the leaders of the community uh, had sworn an oath. Now, Note, before we get into the final portion of verse 18, I want to just say this to you. If you remember right, the Gibeonites come as these different groups, and we've named them in the last lesson. They all come uh, from these different cities a short distance away, three days' journey, not from a faraway land. That would have put them outside of Canaan, but they were indeed Canaanites. Israel was forbidden to make a covenant with Canaanite uh, uh, tribes. Now, they did. Uh, but uh, it was a varied uh, a variation of of the, of a uh, of, of what was desired. But the fact is, is that they they gave them food, they gave them clothes. They were deceived into believing these people had traveled from a long, long way. Uh, and we looked at that last time. But in the last sentence of verse eighteen, notice this: the Net Bible says the whole community criticized or grumbled against the leaders. I believe in honoring leaders, okay? Uh, I believe in honoring those who take the position of leadership, but I do not believe in leaders demanding honor or demanding respect. Okay, people are going to grumble. That's the nature of of uh, of children of immaturity. Sometimes, what do you do with children? You console them. Uh, you 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 pamper them. Uh, you don't necessarily let them have their way. But you do at least treat children like children, right? So you treat immaturity like your maturity. Well, sometimes leaders make decisions that can be difficult to make. All right, that's one thing. And those who follow can find themselves disgruntled with certain decisions, and they begin to complain. It's important that we understand complaining never gets us anywhere. It never causes us to move forward in the things of, of the kingdom, nor does it cause us to move forward in our in capturing bad thinking and, and uh, thinking as we should. Now, remember that the tribes known as the Gibeonites uh, were not from a distant land, but were indeed neighboring Canaanite tribes. Okay, now back to preceptaustin.org. They say that the leaders who had entered the covenant had to honor their oaths and therefore could not harm the Canaanites uh, in the covenant. All right, so pertaining to the covenant, they had to keep their word. Also note that the Israel's leaders failing to consult the Lord produced discard, a discord in the congregation. When a leader... Uh, and let's just take a church congregation, for example. Let's say that you are a pastor or a leader, an apostle, whoever, whatever title you hold, over a congregation of, let's say, 75 to 100 people. And you make a decision, and that decision was made based on maybe the persuasion of a few people, maybe the persuasion of your board, uh, maybe the persuasion of, of popularity, but you knew it was the wrong decision. And one of the things you did wrong is you did not consult the Lord about what to do. So you made the decision, you announced the decision, and lo and behold, people begin to complain. Well, the Hebrew word for grumble is said to be translated in the Greek to mean uh, to, uh, to mean to express dissatisfaction, uh, complain, 
grumble uh, aloud or to mutter. Now, I want to show you something. <coughs> grumble in the English dictionaries is defined as a loud, low, dull. Now, notice that loud, low, dull really are three different words and three different expressions. But uh, it's described, defined as a loud, low, dull, continuous noise, a complaint uttered in a low and distinct tone to make a low growling or rumbling noise uh, like a hungry stomach or certain animals to make complaining remarks or noises under one's breath to utter or emit low dull rumbling sounds to utter complaints in a nagging or discontented uh, way to complain about something in a bad tempered way. Now the fact is that that's a very extensive definition but all of that is true. Uh, sometimes when we get upset about certain things that were done wrong to us or uh, uh, near us, we begin to mutter and we begin to grumble and complain under our breath. People can't hardly hear us. But here's the thing. Father hears us, okay? Father God always hears. Now, uh, commentator Robert Robb writes, as a result of the impetuous decision that was based solely on carnal reasoning, they in effect not only allowed an enemy battalion that should have been destroyed uh, of the hook, uh, but, uh, uh, but also, uh, and the hook here meaning the sword or the spear, but also allowed the, the enemy into their camp. It was a mistake, a foolish mistake, and Joshua and the people had to live with the consequences of their mistake, and all because uh, they didn't seek guidance from God on a matter. They took a hasty decision about an important matter, uh, based solely upon their own powers of human reasoning and without uh, seeking clear guidance from God, and they got it wrong. Uh, if only they had taken the time to bring the matter before God. Okay, so for me, this is a type of attitude, uh, the type of an attitude that is a major issue today among the grace crowd. Uh, now, I believe in grace, Okay, I believe in God's grace. I believe that God's grace covers all and covers all things. Uh, the, the scriptures teach us that God's grace covers all sin. But still, I believe in open communication with my Father. And I have open communication, uh, which means to uh, first admit that I do not know everything, even though the fullness of the knowledge of the Christ mind is within me. The Christ mind is in me. Everything that God knows, I know in terms of that which is in me. But quite honestly, uh, here in a flesh realm, everything that is supernatural that was implanted within me at creation has not uh, been uh, birthed forth yet or has uh, I've not become aware of that. So since I am not yet aware of all the knowledge of my Father's mind uh, within me, I need to ask or consult the Lord about many different things. Now, notice this in Joshua 9, verse 19 from the Net Bible. It says, but all the leaders told the whole community, we swore an oath to them in the name of or by uh, the Lord God of Israel. So now we can't hurt them. We can't touch them. All right. Now, notice this. Commentary says it is refreshing to see that going back on their word was not even really a possibility for the rulers of Israel. This is this was a simple matter, uh, not even up for debate. We may not touch them. Now, I, I want to talk about mistakes, but before I do, there have been many ministers, okay, on national television and so on. Um that have, have made mistakes, have done some things wrong, and got on national television and said that I've sinned before God, I've messed up, and so on. Okay, I understand that. All right. And I'm not against to say, you know, whoops, I made a mistake. How about this? Uh, I, I lied. I got backed into a corner, and I lied. 
uh, followed by an, oh well, I'm covered by God's grace. Uh, to me, that's not an excuse to, to, uh, to, to simply throw aside the responsibility I have to be honest and truthful in my decisions and conversations to my fellow men, brothers and sisters alike, uh, even before the Lord. Now, I want to say this again. To say, I made a mistake. Uh, whoops, I blew it. Uh, I messed up. I have no issue with that. But to say, oh well, I'm covered by the grace of God. For me, that is not an excuse that says, you know what, uh, I might have messed up, but hey, I'm just shirking off the responsibility. We well, see, sometimes I think we have taken the concept of grace as a license to do anything we want to and simply excuse deliberate errors in our decision making. Uh, the leaders of Israel took their bad choices seriously. Now, you can say, well, we're not in the Old Testament. I agree. We're not under the law. I agree. Jesus didn't come to destroy the law, but he came to fulfill it. He became the missing part that when they formed the law, the law of Moses, they left that part out. And so he's the missing piece. And being the missing piece, the scriptures say that he said, you know, you've got all these laws, but I've come to give you two new laws. I love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The second one's like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. But later on, uh, before uh, Jesus went to the cross at Passover, he said, I give you one commandment, one new commandment. And when I read this, to me, I could read into this to say this commandment supersedes all other commandments, right? Okay, so in that, he said, love one another as I have loved you. That is the important thing. That is the commandment if we were going to live by a commandment. And although we're not in the Old Testament, they still took their bad choices seriously and swore an oath not to harm the Gibeonites just because of the choice that Israel had previously made. You know, it would have been great to uh, wipe out Gibeon. Now, please understand, uh, I'll explain what this means in, before I'm done today. But, you know, I, I just simply don't believe that we ought to make excuses for the mistakes we make, but we ought to stand up to and face of the consequences of our, our our mistakes. Now, I don't believe in getting down in the dumps either, uh, just because I messed up or made a bad decision uh, in spite of the consequences that come. I believe in taking responsibility with no depression. You say, but Dr. Bill, everybody gets down in the dumps. They get discouraged over the mistakes they made. Look, the fact is that I do not get down in the dumps just because I messed up. I face the music, so to speak. I face the consequences, and I deal with it. Now, back to preceptaustin.org. They say, the leaders showed integrity in holding uh, firm on the covenant peace treaty and would not violate it because they had sworn uh, by the Lord, uh, God of Israel. Now, Spurgeon, everybody knows Spurgeon, the writer, the author Spurgeon, says, an oath is never to be lightly treated nor a promise either. Uh, indeed, the Christian man's or woman's word is his or her bond and is every way as binding as an oath. Now, commentator Stephen Grant writes, the swearing of an oath in the New Testament was a serious step and had significant consequences. It was the unbreakable word of a person which uh, invoked the authority of the name by whom the oath was sworn. To swear an oath by the name of the Lord, uh, Lord God, was to swear by the greatest of all authority, all the authority and character of the Lord was invoked by uh, the oath and the consequences of breaking it were accepted as coming from the Lord. Okay, now the Lord didn't say that and the Lord didn't say I'm going to punish you. But that's how serious they took the oath. So when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, Hebrews 6, verse 13. And in the Old Testament, the Lord condemned those who swore falsely, Zechariah 5, verses 3 and 4, and Malachi 3, verse 5. In the New Testament, James instructs the believer, swear not neither by heaven 
or by earth, neither by any other oath. And let your yea be yea, and your nay be nay, lest you fall into condemnation. Uh, James 5.12. The, and, and let me just say this. You ought to be truthful and honest. Period. To do that, you don't have to say, I swear by the name of God that I will keep my word. Just be truthful. That's all James is saying. Uh, you don't have to, and, and, and if you blow it, uh, let your yea be yea, your nay be nay, yes, no, be very, uh, uh, as a matter of fact about it. Well, he goes on to say the Christian should not have to call upon a greater authority to lend weight to his word. As a believer, his word should be true. So while much of biblical writings were often the view of what God was saying versus the interpretation of the original language, still yet to honor your word is not only a moral responsibility, but also a matter of honoring your Father God in all that you do. Now, Joshua 9, verse 20, they go on and say, uh, in the Net Bible says, we must let them live. So, before, they wanted to join Israel as a part of their tribe, the Gibeonite tribes. But what happened was, is that they said, okay, you know what, here's what we've decided. We make a commitment to you. We're going to let you live so that we can escape the curse attached to the oath we swore to them. Now, from a translator note, it says that the Hebrew renders this as this is what we will do to them, keeping them alive so there will uh, not be uh, upon us anger concerning the oath which we swore to them. Now, later on in Scripture, we find in 2 Samuel 21, chapter 21, where King Saul broke this vow to the Gibeonites and his sons brought famine upon Israel in the days of David. From the English interpretation of the writings of ancient scriptures, we find many, inter many misinterpretations of words and their meanings, such as the word sin, which clearly refers to being in error or to be mistaken. Now, the English word for sin has been defined, uh, which is the Greek word hamartia. Uh, it means uh, a mistaken identity. Uh, the, and, and, and means that the things people do in life, including the poor or the bad decisions made, are done so from a wrong identity. Notice what the leaders of Israel said. We must let them live so that we can escape the curse attached to the oath we swore to them. The fact is that what they called a curse today would be called consequences. Now let me stop you right there. Too many people are still believing that we live under a curse, even for our mistakes, which we call disobedience. We're not living in the Old Testament, folks. We're not living under the law. We're living under, uh, not the law of Moses, but the, 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 the law of love. The law of love in the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, that, that thing that you call a curse is not a curse, it's called consequences, uh, which we know uh, uh, this is what follows the choices we make. So going back on one's word was not healthy or good back then, no more than it is today, except that we have an understanding of Father's unconditional love toward his creation, instead of looking for the wrath of God. By the way, the word wrath, translated in the New Testament, uh, is actually translated uh, in the Greek language as passion. So it's talking about God's passion for his creation, not his wrath. His wrath is not being poured out, not the English word wrath, but his passion, his passionate love toward his creation. Now, Joshua 9.21 in the Net Bible says, The leaders then added, Let them live, so that they become woodcutters and water carriers for the whole community, as the leaders had decided. So since Joshua could not kill the Gibeonites, Commentary says that he could control them by making them potential workmen for the tabernacle service. They would serve in lowly and humble ways. Why is that? Because of their deception, okay? Their intent to deceive the children of Israel. Uh, they would serve in these humble ways, such as in cutting wood for sacrificial fires and by carrying water used in the services of the tabernacle. By letting the Gibeonite tribes live, 
they made them servants, which was the consequences for their attempted deception toward Israel. Now, even though this gave Israel some degree of control over them, still yet they were pagan idolaters and could potentially pose what some call a spiritual snare for Israel, uh, which some commentators point to why God wanted to utterly destroy them in the first place. So the bottom line is that since we have determined that the Gibeonites were also some of the wandering tribes of Canaan, W-A-N-D-E-R-I-N-G, wandering tribes, not W-O, but W-A, uh, we can also uh, see this as an allegory for the wandering thoughts within the mind of our souls. And here's the thing about it. We need to learn to capture those unrenewed thoughts and convert them into thinking the thoughts of God. Now, the truth is that in our human form awareness, we often spend hours and days trying to figure out the, uh, the answers to life's challenges or even how to fix mistakes when the entire time we are eternally united with our Creator, amen, who holds the answer to all things within just waiting for you to ask and hear what Father has to say. So my point to all of this is that even though uh, we make choices and those around us make choices, uh, the truth is, is that we really do need to be aware of our choices. And our choices also have consequences attached to them. That's right. Consequences. Uh, it's not a curse. We're not living under the Old Testament law again, Deuteronomy chapter 28, the blessings and cursings. This is called not a curse, but consequences. So our decisions bring consequences that we must face up to. If you make a bad choice, you got to deal with the consequences. If you make a bad financial decision, you got to deal with the consequences. Why is that? Because you gave your word. Now, maybe as we see in this story, you gave your word because you did not consult the Lord. That's the number one reason I believe that people make mistakes. But let me also say this, we're really dealing with not a tribe of people in Canaan, but we're dealing with the, the allegory of the wandering thoughts within our own soul. So what do you do with wandering thoughts? Well, first of all, we capture thoughts that are wrong, that are in, that do not line up to the truth of God's word. And we speak or we preach to our thinking the truth. Now, I am a person who studies continuously. I spend several days a week studying and, and, and excavating, uh, you might call it exegesis, uh, the, the technical term, but I'm excavating the truth from the original language uh, even when I look at our English Bible today. I'm not a proponent of our English Bible. I am a proponent, however, of the original language. And it takes a lot of time to spend with the Lord in understanding the original language. So I'm very much a proponent of studying. But what happens is, as I'm studying, I'm reading, and I'm rehearsing, I'm speaking the things I discover, what takes place is more unrenewed thinking in my soul becomes renewed to truth. And so I believe the day will come for all of us that all unrenewed thinking will no longer exist, that we will be so renewed that we will understand the capacity or the contents of the Father's mind. I think that's when we'll stop making mistakes and we'll stop uh, doing things wrong in terms of, of the things that are called error. So I want to encourage you today, deal with your thoughts. If we've learned anything in chapter 9, I think we've got one more lesson to go in chapter 9, uh, but if we've learned anything, that is deal with your thoughts. If your thoughts are wrong, if they're in error, deal with them. Uh, at, at all costs, deal with them because uh, it's important that we align our thinking with the mind of our Father. Amen. I hope you've got something out of this lesson today. I want to encourage you to click like and then click share. And then also I would like to encourage you to uh, 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 invite people to watch. Okay, this is so important. Uh, invite people to watch as we look at these lessons and we continue to investigate uh, more of these um, truths from the book of Joshua. 
uh, I, I'm going to post some information here, probably more information I should be adding, such as my partner page in uh, YouTube and uh, different things. Uh, you can go to our website and you can uh, see all the things that we do there. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and post the website, uh, wbs u.org and uh, you can go to our website you can join become a student i've received student applications yesterday and today also you can go there and see our ministry functions uh, we ordain ministers and and much more so much stuff to be uh done there the website's still being set up so much stuff going on but i just want to be a blessing to you so i'll see you next time everybody have a wonderful day bye bye everyone